This is a review of The Darkest Hour, just a way of getting into a bigger subject. Winston Churchill, my dude right here, is one of my heroes. All of my friends, at one time or another, have been regaled by me with samples of Churchillian wit. So I will share my favorite. During the 30s, Churchill and George Bernard Shaw were both socially, social outcasts. Shaw had not written a hit in a decade or two. Churchill paced at Chartwell, distrusted as a warmonger. Per Churchill paced at Chartwell, Chartwell distrusted as a warmonger. Shaw wrote a play, Geneva, I believe, which went into production. As opening night approached, Shaw sent a wire to Churchill. Winston! I left two tickets at will call for opening night of my new play. Bring a friend, if you have one. Churchill wired back, Bernard, congratulations on your new play. My apologies, I cannot attend opening night due to a pressing social engagement. But do leave me two tickets to the second performance of your new play, if there is one. Even the great Shaw, the supreme wit of the early 20th century, proved no match for Churchill. Naturally, I looked forward to seeing Darkest Hour, expecting a comfortable, familiar, familiar evening with my hero. Gary Oldman's performance is incandescent, by the way. Darkest Hour delivers a few surprises. Neville Chamberlain, after the vote of no confidence, remain, retained his seat on the Tory front bench, silently leading the party. When Churchill gave his maiden speech as prime minister, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Chamberlain and Lord Halifax orchestrated a, a cool response. There was only a plight, uh, there was only polite applause from the opposition. In the following weeks that May, Halifax worked tirelessly at a separate piece. Capitulation came much nearer than I thought. There was a scene of Churchill calling President Roosevelt. FDR's hands were tied by the Neutrality Acts, the creation of the, which was a creation of the America First neo-fascists. I was glad the producers exposed this low moment in American history. We need to be reminded of that right now, because that's what's going on right now. The movie ends with a second great speech. We shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them on the landing grounds. We shall never surrender. This time, the opposition, led by Labour, cheered spontaneously. The Tories sat on their hands until Church Chamberlain gave them the signal to cheer. I left the theatre with a heightened awareness of how close freedom strolled to the precipice. The British upper classes, through their instrument, the Conservative Party, were ready to sell out the British people if the Nazis allowed them to keep their country estates. The America First crowd did not care a fig for freedom. Only when attacked by a non-white people did they get out of the way to let the country fight. To today we face an enemy more dangerous than Hitler. Putin is more intelligent than Hitler and far more patient. He is playing a rather weak hand remarkably well. His objective, an international client oligarchy Russian style, a vast, turning the entire global economy into a vast criminal enterprise is achievable, very achievable, the end of democracy. The free world in this crisis is led by a mentally diseased degenerate comic opera fascist traitor, Putin's stooge. Yet the problem is bigger than Trump. The instrument of the American plutocracy, the Republican Party, is half seduced by Putin. A sizable, chunk, a sizable chunk of our economic ruling, ruling elite envies the Russian oligarchs. They envy the oligarchy's mastery of the masses. They envy the disposal of whistleblowers like Magnitsky. In the deepest sense of the word, they are traitors. Have you ever wondered whether, in sabotaging the Mueller probe, they are protecting themselves as much as Trump? This right-wing conspiracy is so brazen, it strolls in the open air. As many as 30% of us, perhaps, are so distressed by social pluralism that we are borderline fascists. Russian money did not turn their pointy heads. 
Their need for scapegoats is a function of their own folly and a mortgage, not a mortgage to Russian manipulation. Collective psychic desperation renders them the malleable instruments of a domestic demagogue. They do not care whether he is a stooge. But the stooge knows where his bread is buttered, and so does the Republican leadership. All are unfit, especially the grossly misnamed Freedom Caucus, to lead our country through this crisis, the fourth turning of American history. Now, what it occurs to me is that if we had a parliamentary system, Mitt Romney would be president right now. And he would deserve to be, because he warned us five years ago. The 2012 election, mind you, let me preface this by saying I'm a big fan of President Obama, okay? But Putin warned us that our greatest enemy was, I meant Putin, uh, Romney warned us that our greatest enemy was the Russians. Okay, and I'll get into the difference between the Russian challenge and the Chinese challenge, not in this video, but somewhere else, because the Bannon crowd has it completely wrong. The, our primary enemy is, our, is Putin and the Russian oligarchs. They are, that's who we must confront. And Romney was right about that. And the Democrats quipped to that remark, oh, the Republicans want their Cold War back. Well, you know, that was a nice little quip, and I laughed, and I hoped it was true, but we, that wishful thinking has been exposed as being idiotic. And today, Pres President Obama should bring that up and apologize to, to Mitt Romney and back what he said. All right, we need to confront the beast now. What just happened that the the uh, biological weapons attack on on Salisbury, England, is the moral equivalent of Hitler's march into the Sudetenland. The other, and then that attack is followed up with that screwball in the White House. That I don't even have words to describe my dis my contempt for that mentally diseased degenerate. He calls up Putin to congratulate him <clears throat> on winning a rigged election. That is the moral equivalent of Neville Chamberlain <clears throat> returning to England, <clears throat> waving the piece of paper that we have peace in our times. That's where we're at. That is the moment. This is the moment. Get it straight. We are <clears throat> in a battle for the free world. We must get rid of this clown. We must confront the beast.